now a personal take on the aftermath of the violence in Charlottesville. Former Foreign Service officer and Democratic campaign aide Brennan Gilmore was there to join the counter-protests against a Unite the Right rally. He witnessed the car plow into a crowd of protesters, killing Heather Heyer and injuring 19 others. He was taking a video that captured the incident. He made it public, did some news media interviews, and then came death threats and conspiracy theories. Brennan Gilmore joins me now. Thank you for being here. Thank so, you, Brennan, Brennan, tell us again, why, why did you want to be part of this protest? Well, I thought it was very important uh, to be there as a show of numbers uh, against these white supremacists. I think any time you have this uh, very vile ideology show its face in our country, you need to have the majority of people who reject it uh, show up and, and show that the, the numbers are on our side. And so that's what took me to Charlottesville that day. And you were saying this is close to your hometown. Yes, I live in Charlottesville now. So what exactly did you witness? Well, the day, uh, as soon as I got there and early in the morning, it had already become quite tense, and there were fights breaking out between counter-protesters and, uh, and the white supremacists in the, in the park. Um, that became pretty violent pretty quickly, you know, a lot of fist fights, uh, things that were thrown, water bottles. On both bottles. sides. Uh, yes, and this was, this was happening between both sides. Uh, shortly thereafter, the state of emergency was declared, so that central location of the protest was broken up by a pretty overwhelming police presence. Uh, and then these groups split apart and moved elsewhere in Charlotte. And the situation became quite dangerous as, as these groups, uh, you know, were, were, were wandering the streets. And so, not long after, uh, I found myself on a side street, 4th Street in Charlottesville, with a couple of friends, and I witnessed a, uh, a, a crowd of counter-protesters, of anti-racist protesters, coming up 4th Street. Uh, and I began to film their march. And they were in, you know, a celebratory mood, thinking that after the state of emergency, these white supremacists and Nazi groups had been banished from, from Charlottesville. I uh, began filming when, from behind me, I heard a, a vehicle accelerating very quickly. I turned and saw uh, the vehicle in question come down 4th Street at a very high rate of speed. Uh, it went over a, a median area and then barreled into the crowd, uh, sending bodies flying everywhere. You were there. You attended, I think, to some of the injured. Then you quickly posted this online. And then within a day or so, what happened? That's correct. I, well, I immediately gave the video to police because I realized that I had evidence, uh, and then and then took a little while to determine the the benefits of posting it online. I, I did make a decision to do so, uh, and basically within 24, 36 hours, uh, I received a phone call from my sister, uh, who had been monitoring, um, you know, my presence on, on the internet and in media, and she said, um, Brennan, I've I've found this uh, you know alt right Nazi message board, and they've published uh, our parents' home address, uh, and there's death threats uh, towards you. And they're suggesting that you are somehow involved uh, in the attack, uh, either as an orchestrator or somehow uh, played a role, uh, and that you weren't just there to film it, but you were actually there to, uh, as part of the arrangement. Some of these threats were pretty graphic, but what I mean, what were the, what were the kinds of things they were saying? Oh, you, you know, you're a dead man walking. You're a, a CIA operative. You work for George Soros or Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or a Jewish conspiracy, uh, and you know we're coming for you. We know where you are. Uh, you know you're going to burn in hell. Uh, any sort of uh, a litany of, of, of accusations and threats that I you know can't discuss on on television. Uh, but they came in on on Twitter, uh, via Facebook, um, and posted on these message boards uh, at, a, at a at a pretty alarming rate. There were there were reports. I know on the uh, the very the far right uh, uh, site called Infowars. The, the yes, that's correct. Within you know a couple of days, uh, I you know these these conspiracy conspiracy theories started on some rather uh, bizarre sites that sort of twisted my my former service uh, with the State Department into accusations that I had caused genocide in Africa uh, and some just ridiculously unbelievable things. Um, but yes, by by a couple of days after the incident, it was on Infowars with a, an hour long special about how the whole thing in Charlottesville was a Soros plot to destabilize the country. George Soros being the wealthy... Uh, Correct, the uh, uh, billionaire businessman. hedge fund manager. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and that I had played a key role uh, as an operative and, 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 you know, that this, my role in it helped expose the truth. Is there anything about what you did or how you got involved, Brennan, that could have been interpreted as part of organizing this, making it happen? 
Uh, well, I think what uh, what triggered a lot of people was my background with the federal government and with uh, you know Democrat uh, Democratic politics. I had uh, worked as chief of staff to Tom Periello, who had run for governor of Virginia, and I'd spent many years uh, in the State Department. And for uh, you know some people, they they think that that equates to some sort of uh, uh, um, you know so sort of spy work. But I was very proud of my Foreign Service career and what I did overseas. It had nothing to do with that. Um, but you know, for people that are used to watching movies and things it, it and the truth is um, is less uh, less less relevant than uh, than the ideas that they have in their mind you were telling us just before this that this has died down a little some of the threats and so forth it's still out there how are you dealing with it personally well, yeah, I mean, if anything, it's emboldened me to speak even more. Uh, you know, the, the threats have come in and they're, you know, this is a tactic from the alt-right to try and intimidate people into not calling things as they see them and to not talk about the truth of, of, of a very, very difficult situation for our country, and that is the resurgence of a violent ideology of white supremacy. Um, so, you know, if anything, it's, it's, it's convinced me to be even louder in condemning this, and the, the reason I went to Charlottesville in the first place uh, was to stand up against it. And so, you know, certainly I was taken aback and and, and worried for my family's safety, um, but you know they've they've also been incredibly uh, insistent that I continue to speak out and use this platform, which I came by in a very un unfortunate way, uh, to push back against something that can you know do a lot of damage to us. What would you say you've learned from this experience? The broader question here is, you know, how how dangerous this ideology is for our country. What we saw in Charlottesville, and this is what I've seen overseas as well. I worked in a lot of conflict areas in Africa where you've seen these very destructive forces of tribalism of racism be manipulated and instrumentalized by political leaders. Uh, and they're forces that once they are sort of, once the Pandora's box of racism is opened up, uh, it can spiral out of control very, very quickly. And so I think, you know, it's imperative that political leaders on all sides condemn this and say, you know, here's the bounds of what's acceptable in our political discourse in the United States. And we draw a very firm line and absolutely exile the idea of an ideology, white supremacy, which by its very nature is violence, which in necessitates, you know, removing certain classes or, or races of citizens. And we've some, seen some leaders do this, but, but, but not enough. Well, it's clearly something that I think that many people thought couldn't happen in the United States, but here it is. Absolutely. Um, I think it can happen anywhere, and it's incredibly destructive when it rears its head. It, need, it belongs in the dustbin of history. Brennan Gilmore, thank you very much. Thank you.